sentimental about craft, uh, I think. He's really up to the future with his um, choice of a 3D design and the challenges that has to offer. So, the word is up to you. I think he won many prizes. You look at his CVs, it's already such a list, and he's the youngest participant of this firm, so I think we will hear a lot of him. Thank you. Um, hello, welcome everybody. Um, I want to um, give a short word how um, I ended up in art, because of course that's a really big change in your life. Um, uh, I wanted to become uh, an accountant on my 15th, so my life took a, a different uh, direction. Um, I could convince my parents to go to an uh, art school and I uh, started with um, architecture on my 15th. Um, but architecture at your 15 is still uh, at that time drawing with pen and paper, really boring lessons about uh, perspective, so uh, it was really not for me. Uh, on my 16, I went uh, to uh, study thermic. Uh, um, and at that same time, I also got um, um, computer lessons and suddenly I came from a, a background in a really game addiction. Suddenly, okay, you can also do something different with a computer than just playing games. And on my um, 17, I, always, uh, I already was um, teaching together with the teacher uh, lessons about Photoshop because I knew the language of computer. They could not learn me anything about that. Um, of course, I took some directions and uh, on my 18, I wanted to go really like uh, the idea of the upper bench. I wanted to do an education where you could uh, study everything. Of course, I didn't knew that that was a big illusion. But I found an education um, at the Academy of Ghent uh, on paper. You had more or less everything. In reality, I had the feeling um, it were um, a lot of uh, old teachers waiting for their pension and uh, I got um, a little bit uh, lessons in uh, photography, we got uh, some lessons in film, but I did have the feeling that I was really learning a lot and that I was uh, on my place. So in my 20, I um, went to um, another education that was uh, called uh, Mixed Media. And um, Mixed Media, to give you an idea, it's an education where you can only go from uh, your 20, so you have to have already a degree of the first two, uh, two years at the academy. And um, suddenly I was in class with uh, classmates that were like uh, 20 years older, that already found their direction in life, and I was at that time still struggling, finding out what I wanted to do. Um, the big um, nice thing was that all my uh, classmates were um, photographers and uh, filmmakers, so this is actually my uh, classroom that I uh, took over after a year and I had a um, really big space uh, on school. Um, the nice thing was that I really met uh, one teacher that uh, made really the change for me. Um, the teacher is called uh, Dani Mates. But what he did was um, bringing all his students, like uh, the mo Monday morning, we were all sitting around the table and we had to explain our work to each other. We have to give a uh, comment to each other. And actually, on the end, the teacher did have to say a lot because your fellow uh, student also see what's good or bad in your work. But it really made that you had to talk and you had to think about what you were doing. Another thing with that teacher was we were playing. He would um, move something in my studio to see how concentrated is the student, busy with his work. Does he see that that made the structure better or worse? So this is really what I learned on school. I think I don't really learn craftsmanship. Um, craftsmanship you can definitely learn just by uh, trying, by uh, looking to a book, by buying a machine, tiring it out. But to really think about um, art, to think about your work, it's something that is very difficult just from a book. So it was for me very clear I, I wanted to do sculpture. Um, but at the same time, I didn't have the space to make really huge installations and I love to, to make huge installations. So I ended up again with the computer and started um, to look to 3D software. I never worked with it, but I just started buying books in uh, New York, buying books in, uh, through Amazon and just learning on myself the program. And my first exhibitions I tried out on a virtual level, uh, I tried out on the computer before I would uh, start to realize them or before I would come to an exhibition space and to testing it out. Um, this is one of the first sculptures uh, after I graduated. It's uh, called uh, Sobocops. 
it's my uh, first yellow drop and you will see on the end uh, it's an important work. Um, I was really interested not so much in uh, the old or the new, but really in the combination. For me it represents like um, the old architecture still working with pen and paper, the really straight lines against uh, the new architecture, working with computer software, working with organic shapes, working with a block shape. So I wanted to put the two in contrast. But at the same time, when I graduated, I had the feeling of sculpture. It's not exciting anymore, there's nothing happening. Uh, I know what it is, um, it could not challenge me anymore. And because of you using um, software from uh, an architecture world, I was much more interested in architecture because yeah, like an architect like uh, Foster Zellon, he's working with almost 1,500 people. Uh, this is a completely different way of looking to, to craftsmanship, of uh, looking how to realize something. And I was much more interested in the new sculptural language that was developed by those computer softwares um, that you find in, in architecture again. So this is for me, um, at the one side, it's a scale model, it's a pavilion that you can enter. It's something between architecture and sculpture, it's something between furniture. It's playing with um, different elements like real wood, like um, um, imitation wood, concrete, um, plaster. And this is a virtual model. Um, the houses and the clouds are a reality, are a photograph, but everything else is uh, drawn with a computer. So I was able to give my audience an idea how that would look like before I really had uh, or was able to, to make it. The real sculpture is not yet realized on that scale, but it's just a scale model of like uh, one meter. It's still made um, really old school. Uh, uh, I made yellow blobs, still in clay with a plastic wall. So that was my first experience with uh, a casting and with uh, polyester. <coughs> After that, I went much more on to, um, to architecture. But at the same time, with, with the Belgian background, you're really influenced by, by surrealism. I don't know if it's something that is in our blood. But I was really interested in the work of uh, Magritte. And I started to make uh, computer animations. Um, I don't really think that our movies to, to, to just show in a, in a film theater or something, but it were more like uh, virtual sketches um, for um, one sculpture that is turning over to another sculpture that is transforming. Um, it were like sculptures that are growing. Um, really strange because um, animation movies uh, that we know from, uh, from the cinema, except the person, there's actually nothing moving in, uh, in the whole film mostly. Um, so I was not interested in the beginning point or the end point of my animations, but much more in the, the step between. Um, this one is made with uh, casting, it's more like uh, a craftsmanship uh, of mini Europa, because uh, those bricks are like 2mm. But I was actually much more interested to build my house, not like architecture, I'm building a model with uh, just cardboard, I don't want it to, to be a part of a culture where things are uh, thrown away very fast. I wanted to build a magnet, but really build it with bricks. So I went to a shop, okay, I want 20,000 bricks. Um, that was really expensive, and still the brick was also too big for what I had in mind. So I started to think, what is the smallest brick that uh, is still possible by a human to, uh, to build? So I came up with a scale of uh, 5 mm by 5 mm by 9 mm. And I just started my own um, uh, brick factory, just putting uh, the roll of the bread of mother and uh, starting to put some clay. Yeah. And this is actually the wall. Um, the egg is like uh, 90 centimeter to give you an idea of, uh, of the scale. And for me, it's a really important work. Um, um, it's actually an animation still. It's not the beginning or the end of the animation where the house is holding open, but somewhere in the stage in between. And the egg you can really see as the, the sublime, almost as the works of Rancuzzi, it's like a sculpture on his best. But you can see the egg as a really huge apartment building. I think everybody knows like uh, the stickers you see on trams or buses, where you have the advertising on the one side and the other side you can really look through. So it would be technically possible to build this as a huge apartment building. From the outside yellow, from the inside you can perfectly look uh, through the walls. So the sculpture is actually becoming the architecture. And the house, because it's folding open, it doesn't have a function anymore, then the architecture is becoming the sculpture. So every work of mine has, of course, many different directions to interpret it. Also, the windows you see on the yellow egg are actually just a reflection of the windows of the building. So the longer you look to the model, the more uh, levels you will see. 
and to show that it's not just a computer or a, a picture. This is a, how it's made. It's a, a metal skeleton. And then uh, I was almost uh, for three months busy with uh, gluing and um, putting the bricks on the job. And that was really also the really uh, demotivating part because in uh, today, um, yeah, some building constructions they set a house in three months. So it was uh, really something to think about how I would deal with that in the future. Uh, almost 10,000. Oh, by yeah, hand. By hand. Yeah. Oh, by hand. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, this is the next step in, in a more or less the same project, but I wanted to go more complex, I wanted to go much more crazy, and for me, this is almost uh, almost a painting of Dali. It's like a, a camel and a crab that are walking about uh, the beach. Um, on this moment, it only exists as a, as a picture. Um, the clouds and the plants uh, are in reality, are photographed. Everything else is uh, designed by a computer. And on the same level, it's still um, the old uh, ideas. What is sculpture and what is the skin of a sculpture? How do you can deal with the sculpture? But at the same time, also a fantasy. Those sculptures could be a reality. You could perfectly put um, a straight floor in it. But I think it's not really so nice to live with all your uh, walls with your crooked, but it's possible. Um, of course, I want to make those in reality, but how do you start with making something that you cannot read anymore from a, an architecture plan? The plan of a, an architect with just the front, the side, the top, it's not enough anymore to, to read that drawing. Um, so today I'm starting to, to make the, the smallest, uh, the left one. It will be around one meter, that's like the smallest size and I'm able to make it uh, because then I'm getting too thin. And I'm making it now with 3D printing and um, it took me almost five months to draw all the parts and uh, my machine is already almost two months uh, printing to just have the parts, so it's not yet ready. Um, Um, the smallest one will be one meter, and the biggest one will be probably two meter fifty as a scale model. Yeah. And then you plan to do it in reality? Uh, no, no. Uh, if somebody came, I'm always up to it, but uh, I don't think that will ever be the point of that one. Um, another story is uh, the story about uh, Yaranok. Um, I was invited by um, the director of SMAC to do an exhibition in a, a textile factory in Ghent. Um, on that moment I did a residency in Berlin and I said, okay, yeah, I know the space, uh, I agree. But they forgot to tell me one thing, um, it was not uh, the space that we filled with uh, some different artists, but every artist gets one level of the building. So you get a space of 400, 500 square meter. Um, we want new work to the exhibition this in uh, two, three months. So on my level of really um, laboring work, it was not really possible. And in Berlin, after visiting all the museums, I was uh, actually much more interested about uh, tubes that like running through the city while uh, they did construction works. So in Berlin, I was studying a lot of uh, coral reefs, and I came up with the idea of making something of nature but in industrial materials. So my plan was to make this like 30 by 40 meter in uh, metal. So I started to inform what is a part of metal, uh, metal workers. Um, I think with 200,000 euro, just to, to have the cost of the metal, you come now through. Um, so that plan was really fast cancelled. But I had my exhibition, so I needed to come up with a, a solution. And uh, the solution was to um, make my own tubes, uh, to don't uh, buy them in a shop, or, uh, but really make, make my own tubes out of PVC. So I just started from uh, the really typical grey tubes we use uh, for uh, the sewers. Um, with our uh, tubes of uh, 11 centimeter, and I, uh, in PVC, I made my own fences, uh, glued everything, and so I came up with uh, building that sculpture. Um, the actual sculpture you can see here, it's uh, 11 meter on 11 meter, and the nice thing is I can still drive it uh, and move it with my car. So as a sculpture, uh, I am always uh, curious also for my colleagues, where do you put all those big pieces? And this is really the nice thing, the only problem I'm three days busy screwing and uh, putting everything loose. But it's nice, the idea is also that you have a sculpture that you can put every time in a, a different connotation. It's um, also um, connotations like the Meccano and uh, the Lego cubes of my childhood. And you are actually able to put those pieces in a different context and make uh, again a new sculpture of it. 
Um, on that level, I made um, a sculpture for um, the Middelheim Museum for an exhibition about uh, monuments. And I came up with the idea Belgium have uh, a lot of fantastic museums, but actually, except for one, there are all the museums of contemporary art are never built as a museum. And that has a big problem because the doors are never big enough for things that I want to do. Uh, most museums were in the past uh, just a supermarket, uh, they transformed to art museum or a casino, they transformed to art museum. So I came up with the idea to make a really huge sculpture, almost like um, you can come uh, just as a traveler, because as artists we're getting more and more travelers to globalization. You just come with your backpack, pulling open your material and you're uh, building your sculpture. This is actually a replica of uh, the Basilic of uh, Kuppelberg in Brussels. So it would be a sculpture of 120 meter long, and the tubes would be between 4 and 40 centimeter, so it would be more a truck than just a backpack. Um, and the idea is to have like a yellow tent uh, inside, so you could do actually exhibitions inside the sculpture. And the outside is a perfectly replica, but only using the ribs, the lines of uh, the public of Kuppelberg. Um, this is a virtual picture, only the clothes are reality, so with computer animation you can draw in the grass and uh, draw in the water so you can give an audience an idea if it ever would be built on that size or it would look like. Um, in reality it was um, just a small scale model that I did with uh, 3D printing. This is not my first 3D print, I will tell you uh, later more, but it gives you a little bit an idea. Um, uh, for some people it will be strange but there is actually no hand carving on the whole sculpture. So it's uh, completely printed by a machine, put together and I introduced uh, techniques that they didn't do in 3D printing like uh, the imitation to have bronze or the imitation to have uh, um, metal. So when you saw it in the exhibition you really had the idea that it was a polyester shape with uh, an iron shape over, but in reality it's all uh, plastic. Like every tube here is uh, almost four or five millimeter. But, uh, but, but one fact, yeah. this, that construction, you say it is, uh, it looks like metal, but it is printed plastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I will explain a little bit uh, further. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, this is actually my first uh, 3D print, or actually the image for it. Um, I was invited by um, the Moka Museum in Shanghai to do an exhibition there and I really had a problem for myself because um, I come from a Western culture, I don't know anything about uh, an Asian culture and the most um, Chinese artwork I really don't really understand because it's from a different culture. So I was really, how will I deal with that? How will I put my work <coughs> over there? And I came up um, visiting uh, Shanghai a few times and I was really intrigued by uh, the rock gardens, the temple gardens, really the rocks that are cut out by the water. But at the same time, I am a huge fan and I saw already some beautiful sculptures again of Barbara Hepworth and uh, Henry Moore. And um, if you read uh, the books, they are really um, seen as uh, the inventors of uh, the whole Indian sculpture. In our uh, Western culture, there is nobody before them that really made uh, holes inside the sculpture. So I was really intrigued by that, but at the same time, I was able with uh, my computer to go much further than where Henry Moore was able. He was only able to carve something to where he could reach with his hand. But with the computer, I could uh, delete parts, I could hide parts, go inside, and really go really crazy in my modeling. So I made almost um, 900,000 sketches before I came to that show. Um, I'm really a control freak and I wanted to, to get a figure, to get a shape where I was able to tell on this moment in my life, I cannot uh, improve it. I can only change it. Uh, that is getting a different artwork, but I cannot improve it anymore. You see also still um, connections with uh, bone structures, also a fascination of uh, Henry Moore that actually grew up on a chicken farm. So he, he had all uh, the bones. Uh, or it's actually a chicken farm he bought, and while he was uh, gardening, he every time uh, found the chicken bones. But then I made this in my computer, and then the big quest was, yeah, I'm, I'm a sculptor, I want to have it physical, I have my exhibition, how do, uh, do I end up with that? So I came um, to, to learn the technology about 3D printing, I thought, okay, China, everybody says it's cheaper, I will print it there. I even found a company in China that uh, speaks fluently Dutch, so uh, 
a businessman from here that was there, but they did say, oh, well, no, no, something so complex, we, we don't start on that. Luckily in Belgium we have a, a lot of good technology and one of the biggest 3D printing companies is uh, Materialize in uh, Levant. So I uh, knocked on their door uh, and they said, uh, young guy, uh, we don't uh, put our engineers with some grey hairs. So knocking again, knocking again, and I could convince to them to uh, go around the table and to, to look how could we make that in, uh, in reality. And um, then um, the actual sculpture is only around um, 40 centimeter. The tubes are around 2-3 millimeter. So it's printed, uh, 3D printed, it's printed in layers. What does it mean? You have, of course, different machines, different techniques. But the machine I'm working with is actually, instead of uh, eight, you have a rather big cartridge in your printer, and it's like a PVC on a wire. And then lots of uh, ink that is coming out of your uh, printer head, it's coming uh, PVC melted on 70 degrees. And what does it? It's printing like one silhouette, uh, 0 0.18 millimeter, printing one silhouette, an elevator going a little millimeter down, printing again a silhouette, printing again a silhouette, and on that level you're building up your sculpture. The big advantage is you don't have to be able to get inside to make something very complex. And the sculpture is printing with two, two materials because it cannot print in the air. It needs support, it needs uh, a casting, it needs a mold. Uh, so it's printing a mold and a sculpture at the same time. And um, afterwards you can put it in a chemical bat. Your uh, mold is disappearing, uh, your support is disappearing. And the only thing that is stay over is a um, uh, PVC uh, is a plastic sculpture. I don't know if that's a little bit clear for uh, how that happens. <laughs> um, the nice thing on animation is that I, um, I had my virtual model and I love really the movies you, you know from medicine where they are really doing a roller coaster inside your body. So I did also that in the sculpture and this is actually an image from in that science sculpture. So if you look closely and you go inside this sculpture then you get this kind of images. Um, so I was really surprised because here you really have the feeling to be able to walk in really big caves while the sculpture was only like uh, 40 centimeter high. These are more works, uh, 3D printing. Uh, I played with like uh, the back of a lion, the back of a bison, uh, feet of a crab, um, ears of a devil, to really play with uh, animal parts. Uh, almost like um, maybe the pets of the future. Um, also make a sculpture that actually has no um, uh, volume. It's actually a sculpture that only exists uh, out of lines. Um, then again, that's a nice thing as an artist to meet a lot of different people. And um, I got an invitation from a uh, museum M in Louvain to um, work together. Um, they wanted to do an exhibition where every artist worked together with a surgeon, um, with a scientist. So in the beginning, oh, no, what do I have to do with that? Uh, it's not really my way of working. And it's actually because of that big core wall with tubes. Okay, we have here a surgeon, a professor. He specialized in uh, the Larnex. <laughs> you would be a good match. Uh, we put you two good together. Um, I went to the hospital a few times to uh, take lessons with that professor. He went to my studio to uh, take art lessons with me. And I think on the end we didn't really learn a lot of each other, except uh, each other's passion. And that surgeon had a lot of medical books like that, that he used to, to make, because um, he's actually the only one in the world that is able to transplant a larynx. Um, I hope uh, you're up to it, but for people that have like a little um, uh, uh, cancer in it, they can just uh, take it away. But for people that have a, a bigger part in it, you were um, dead. And he made a new invention by putting the larynx, the tube of a dead person, in your arm to be like three, nine months symbolically with that in your arm because the veins are too small to sue and then they put it back in the neck. So on that level he already saved um, five, six billion persons. So for me that's really science fiction coming to reality. So I started to use his medical books um, to use his drawings as um, my Lego cubes to make uh, a new sculpture for a museum M. And this was actually the reality, um, that was my piece. Um, it's actually also the first, um, maybe more figurative piece. Um, I never wanted to work with um, persons, but um, I'm more and more interested in, uh, in doing that. 
So for me, it was a print of seven meter by eight meter. I wanted to get the feeling like uh, coming in an old temple of Greece and then see the statues of Athena. It's almost like a head uh, throw out of his skin, uh, almost purple belt. And at the same time, with uh, the black and the yellow, it's like uh, Ding and it Yang. It's like uh, an industrial shape against an organic shape. It are almost uh, two identities in a person fighting for each other. Um, so that's the more interesting part. The one will see a monster, the other one will see a more anatomical <coughs> part. Uh, on top you see like the tubes of the lung, you see the larynx. So I'm not a doctor, it doesn't have to be anatomically correct, but I'm using them to make them. And then again, always lovely, but always um, <coughs> very hard for an artist. I was able to draw something in my computer, but I had no clue how I could be able to make that physically. So that was really my big worry, and at the same time it made me very happy. I was able to draw something that I was not able to make it, but how would I deal with that? Um, it took me almost a um, thousand uh, drawing lessons and uh, a lot of uh, engineer conversations to convince them to uh, try it. Uh, and this is actually the sculpture in reality, it's uh, 60 centimeter, and um, the veins are like 2-3 uh, millimeter. It's uh, not in the two colors, just because technical, on that moment, there were no printers existing that were able to print in two colors, and I was never able, if I would print it in parts, to uh, put it back together. Um, so again, from that uh, frustration, I ended up making uh, new sculptures, where I hand-painted them in uh, different layers. So this is actually a sculpture um, that's made uh, on the one side you have the blue shape that's really straight and on the other side you have the yellow blob that's really blobby. Um, so I wanted to have a contrast almost. Um, a lot of my sculptures have um, the both connotations. On the one side you can say the two shapes are fight fighting with each other, but you can always say they are also embracing. So you can look at that at two levels. And to give you an idea, it's almost like a, painting when you are uh, going to the dentist, uh, putting mirrors um, and just have to cut off the hairs of my pencils, glue them on a, a wire to be able to go to uh, all the angles to, uh, to paint this. Because um, this sculpture is only 50-60 uh, centimeter high, but I'm also making it uh, as a model of a 3 meter high, but then I'm afraid I'm 5 months busy with uh, just polishing it. Um, another story, um, I was invited by um, the Hermitage in Amsterdam to do an exhibition next to the old masters, the old Flemish masters, they wanted to do an exhibition, the new Flemish masters, um, Peter Paul Rubens, uh, Van Dijk, your dance, and oh, what do I have to do? I have a huge respect for uh, those painters, their history, but it's not really my connection, my feeling. Um, so I started to search the blobby shape in the paintings, so I ended up <coughs> with painting of uh, Rubens. Not the idea to uh, still make uh, a figure, but uh, this was the result. So um, putting the skeleton that is normally inside the body, putting outside the body, you can still see um, uh, bell cheeks, you can still see the belly button, uh, you can see the nipple, so you can still feel a lot of things. Uh, also, the skin of the sculpture has a little bit like the cellulose, um, so it's really putting human details in it. And also, again, I got like two months, but in two months I was never able to make it as a sculpture uh, because it's too labor. So I ended up in the exhibition with an animation, but in the animation you see really coming in the hive, pumping up, and you see like a 360 degrees with the, with the sound. And the sculpture actually came to look like that. It was also, you saw the first picture of my uh, studio at school, where it was much more uh, really loose with the paint, um, more brick and brack. Um, you know, I have a lot of craftsmanship, uh, I know how to do it, and I'm able to get a perfectly color polished sculpture. So I wanted to have a little again the, the, the hand of the artist uh, to make a connotation. Also, the sculpture is printed in one piece, but it gives the illusion as if it are two identities that are fighting with each other. Um, there's also a sculpture. Um, sometimes it's really different how an audience looks like that. I was just interested in the paintings of Rubens and inspiring on that. Of course, you have all your background uh, interested in nature. But um, for the one, one um, time I did a, a touring exhibition and uh, 
somebody asked, uh, where, where are you with your thoughts? And I said, oh, why do you ask that? Because he saw too much uh, lingerie and uh, content, it, so it's a uh, delay. So it's every time looking how people are looking to the sculpture. Um, I want also to tell you something more about um, uh, big pieces. Um, I got uh, the question um, from um, the owner of this building to uh, think about um, a sculpture to put on the rooftops. Um, I got only one um, uh, obligation. It has to be a sculpture that uh, didn't weigh too much because it was a, an old roof. Um, I came up uh, very fast with an idea like that, but I thought, yeah, that will be too um, aggressive or um, uh, too big impact for the building. So I started to make uh, smaller designs. But um, when they saw the design, they were immediately uh, interested in this piece. Um, so for me, it's going about uh, an old 19th century building. How we do can be able to, to put almost like um, uh, the crown, uh, the pedestal on top of it. And at the same time, you can also see again the box and the blocks. Actually, the big um, uh, old uh, building, you can see as uh, the box shape. And the sculpture you can see as the organic shape. Um, the limitation of um, having a, a light uh, weight I used because I actually didn't build on the roof but I built on the walls of, uh, of the area. Um, I was inspired by coral reefs, uh, you can see connections with uh, the water cube uh, they build in Beijing. I wanted to have a terrace but at the same time I wanted to, to have a sort of uh, protection. When you are in the terrace you don't feel like uh, naked in the, in the open air. But at the same time, you don't want to have a prison, so the holes have to be big enough. Um, the tubes are like um, 30 centimeters thick, so if you are downstairs, you have the feeling they are more like 10 centimeters. Um, it's a sculpture, I never make a model, because um, that's the nice thing as a sculptor, you, you do a lot of experience and you can imagine how it will look like. And with 3D computer, I'm always in my virtual world and looking how that will deal in it. There's actually a little bit an idea of the, the construction process. Um, the sculpture itself is actually mostly um, um, uh, cut and uh, shaped by a computer. We um, uh, made uh, the silhouette out of uh, wood. On the wood we glued um, uh, big protein uh, plates. And most of you will probably know like uh, the machine used to, to just uh, make a small corner uh, in wood. We just built such a machine ourselves but in big. So the corner is just done by a machine by putting the pieces fit. And that went pretty fast. Um, so the sculpture level ran pretty fast. But then we went with almost 12 people shaving, polishing, shaving, polishing. And everything was covered with um, glass fiber and then polyester to have it really perfectly cars smoothed. Um, every piece is almost uh, 6 meter or 12 meter and uh, 3 meter 40 high. So it is also a big challenge. Um, it was also the first time I really collaborated with, with such a big team to get something done and to have the chance to put one of your ideas on a, a big size. You need also to, to find the, the moments and, and the people in your life to, to give opportunities for that. To give you an idea of the, the transport. <laughs> <coughs> and that is how it uh, looks inside. Um, the Zimmerstraat, um, it's a very nice place, you have um, uh, apartments that you can rent, you have an exhibition space, uh, part of private collection, you have meeting rooms, and the building uh, extended this year, so I was invited to uh, do also an extension of uh, the sculpture process. And on the left, I will show on a better picture, you have a work of uh, Ned Kahn, an American artist, and on the right you have a new sculpture of me. And the question was to have a sculpture where also was a space inside. So you were again limited by that, but the limitation gives also really an interesting point of view. And the sculpture, for some persons, it will be like a big seat where you can sit in. For other persons, it's more like the veil that is falling open, like almost water running from the building. But the veil that is actually hiding something, but because it's hiding something, you're getting much more interested in what's underneath. It's almost um, the feeling of really a big sphinx, uh, like a big uh, monument of uh, Egypt. Um, but it's very difficult to, to see it on the picture. You really have to see it in the space and to feel the, the atmosphere. Um, this is almost uh, 50 meter high. It was uh, transported in, uh, in four pieces with uh, big trucks. And this is actually uh, how it looks like. 50 or 15? 15. 15, 15 meter. 
Um, another sculpture I made for uh, the exhibition in, uh, in Leuven, and it's uh, now uh, going to the entrance hall of uh, Zit in Leuven. And it's a little bit the same story about the sculpture I told you about of uh, Shanghai, of uh, Iker Olsen. I was interested in how can I also make sculptures of that size big. Again, I was stuck. Um, I could not work with companies because they could not read my plan anymore. With just the front to side. So I had to come up with a own system. And one of the ideas I found was uh, it's a Michelangelo. Michelangelo, he's laying like a, a model in a bucket of filthy water. And where the filthy water is standing still, he has like a line to measurements. And actually, the experience I did from a 3D printer and the experience I took from a craftsmanship of Michelangelo, I combined to make those pieces. And a lot of people are thinking they are just 3D printed. No, those pieces are made manually, just the design is made uh, by computer. Um, as an artist, I'm really interested. I don't have ambition to, to become a designer, but I'm really interested to take other barriers, to, to go a step aside. So I wanted also to look how can I transform my language in a, in a sitting bench. Um, um, I made uh, land art, I made uh, land sculptures, uh, I made a door uh, staircase. Um, uh, last week um, I made a playground for children that also fulfills all the laws we have in Belgium on playgrounds. So it's always uh, looking how you can deal with uh, that kind of solutions. Um, I really love to go really complex, the only problem is it's all hand polished, you cannot use a machine. So I think also this filter took maybe, just to polish it, maybe 600, 700 hours. Um, this filter is uh, inspired on uh, Hector Bimar, you know, uh, the entrance hall of uh, the Paris metros. And at night, the white uh, blocks, they illuminate, so you really have the feeling of uh, those kinds of uh, uh, trips that are uh, going on site. Um, I think the most uh, famous sculpture was the sculpture that was on the, the Triennale of uh, Beaufort. It's uh, 8 meters high, it's really difficult to, to get it on picture. And they invited me to design the sculpture and inspire it on uh, the coast. We have, of course, a really big legacy with uh, Delfo in Belgium. So I was really interested how will I have to be uh, my step in that. And I was inspired by um, um, yeah, really the clapping water. Um, just the yellow block was not enough for me. I put uh, three legs under it. So you have much more the feeling about a creature that is uh, walking over the sea, that is uh, walking around. Um, and it's um, uh, a creature for a big audience. It's not really the art historian that's coming to the sea here, but it's really a big audience. So I want to keep that in count and to be able to make work that um, on the one moment uh, everybody can look at it can say, okay, it, teach, um, it um, takes me, uh, it doesn't take me, uh, I have connection, I have no connection. But when you read more, you will understand much more about it. Um, with this, I won an American prize uh, last week. It's, um, for a, a Belgian collector, uh, Van Haags, um, they were renovating this chapel, but they had a, yeah, a really big problem. Um, the chapel had a, an old door. It's um, damaged, but from uh, the heritage, they could not destroy it. So what will they do? They are not able to repair it, but they cannot remove it. So I came up with an idea of this door that just clicks over the old door. Heritage, the law was okay, and everybody is happy. So that's how uh, whole life works. Um, on the picture, it is so small, but it's actually almost uh, six meter high. Um, then I got another question for um, an exhibition um, to make a sculpture for a factory. But the factory was like 35 meter high. If you put a sculpture of four meter next to it, you never see it. So, okay, again, the problem, how do I solve that? Um, so I came up with the idea, you know, all crystal wrapping in the factory. Okay, I want to go uh, wrapping in the factory, but not like crystal, huh? he already done that, I want to do something different. So I wrap in the factory with um, a drawing. Um, it's actually a green factory, so I think it's also one of my uh, uh, first uh, clients that asked, can there not be something more yellow in it? Um, uh, of course, my uh, favorite color, I think that's already 
stage here. Um, and in reality, um, the grain goes really to the top of the factory and it goes to all kinds of machines going down. But what was my problem? Um, I don't know if you really see it good on, um, on the, the model, but you had a lot of windows, a lot of um, uh, mechanical parts sticking out. It's almost like you should say, yeah, for a painter, you have your nice white canvas and they put some parts out of it. Yeah, it's already ruined to put your painting on it. So I had to find a solution how oh, I could make um, those kind of things not um, um, uh, something that I uh, borrowed or, or um, ignored, but that make uh, my artwork even better. So I came up with uh, a raster by putting a raster in it with annotations to Mondrian, to Donald Judd, um, putting a big black, black blob from the bottom, almost like from coming from the hell, from the devil, and uh, the yellow, more. Uh, uh, corner parts coming from the heaven and they are embracing in the middle or fighting in the middle and because of that uh, roster I was able, you can see it very good here, I was able to put some parts of the sculpture before it, to put some parts of the sculpture behind it so you could really have a, a big depth in it um, and it's actually still um, a very old industrial harbour, it's really a harbour coming really inside the centre of the old city, coming uh, close to the station, so everybody passing every day with the train uh, on that track, and that old grey harbour that connecting to the centre of the city has a complete new uh, entrance. So on that level it's really thinking about uh, art history, about uh, art in public, and how can you can deal with that. Um, I really like how. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I will just a few things first. Um, uh, this is um, uh, a new project. Recently, I was invited um, to do a commission for a um, Roman uh, Heritage Museum, and um, these are all sculptures. You see a Roman face folding open for a transformer, um, putting sculpture of mine against the Roman sculptures. <laughs> and putting uh, things like uh, Greener, the alien uh, science fiction movies against uh, Roman Jupiter uh, pillars. Um, putting things of Hercules, of um, gold statues, uh, all connected to, to uh, one piece. And the new project I'm working on is um, because of an exhibition I did this summer in Wageningen, where I met a professor that is a uh, experimenting with uh, food and has a, a patent on the strawberry. For the moment I'm working on a new series of uh, sculptures with um, mutated food, but uh, then in a virtual and physical uh, way. Thank you.